All right, awesome. Welcome to Pipeline for Pipelines. Uh, this is DevOps for Pipeline Development. So we're going to have two really great talks today. The first one is going to be from uh, Federico Nome. Uh, he is a 14-year veteran of VFX software development, and right now he is the toolchain lead for Animal Logic. So he's going to walk you through how Animal Logic tackled the issue of creating reproducible builds and runtime environments. Um, and then second, we're going to have John Hood and Ryan Batrio. Um, so John, John's a longtime fixture and hero at the, the Sunny Woodworks Rigging and Pipeline Development um, Departments, uh, and he's currently serving as the front end architect there. Um, and then Ryan, um, he's got a really neat background. Um, he's originally from uh, interactive media and design. Uh, he got a real passion for software development uh, while he was in school. Came out of that, and he's been working in pipeline ever since. So he is right now on the platform team at ILM. So John and Ryan, um, they're going to walk you through uh, a major initiative they took while they were both at ImageWorks, where uh, they took on this big project to modernize the studio's code management tools. Um, and then once we're all done, um, We'll have a nice Q&A, so put all of your, uh, you know, questions in the chat. Um, Jesse's going to be here. He's going to gather all those up, and then we'll answer some questions with whatever time we have uh, left at the end. Okay. Um, and with that, uh, I don't want to dig into any more of our time. I will pass it over to Federico. So um, hello, hello everybody. Thank you, Danny, for the introduction. Uh, for this talk, uh, I wanted to start off by mentioning uh, the responsibility of the toolchain team. Currently, we support more than 80 developers. That's people in R&D and uh, TDs in production. And to make the life easier of uh, these people, uh, the toolchain team focuses on automation, software quality, uh, creating tools for them, and improving the de development workflows. And something that touches in these uh, four points is what brings me to talk to you today, uh, which is um, reproducible uh, build and runtime environments. What I'm going to show you is the hybrid approach uh, we took to achieve reproducibility at build time and runtime using REST and the container technology. This is the agenda for today. I'll give it a bit of an intro, and then we'll discuss uh, problems, solution, benefits for reproducibility. Uh, in the runtime environments, and uh, then a specialization of those uh, runtime environments. I'll give it a bit of context uh, fair from Animal Logic so you can understand why we went in this hybrid direction. We have been using REST since 2015. If you're not familiar with REST, just uh, in a few words, it's an application package manager. And to have an analogy, just think on Gradle or NPM. And, but one key difference here is that the all the existing packages uh, versions are all installed in the central location and the local environment are dynamically created uh, uh, reference to those central uh, packages. And this give, uh, um, this give us a lot of flexibility in our workflows. It is not perfect, but for us has been a before and after. Uh, in order to be agile, uh, we've broken down our software in uh, more than 2,000 uh, REST packages. That includes uh, our in-house packages and third-party packages. Um, that has allowed us to be really nimble and release in average about uh, you know, 50 packages a day. And now with more than 60,000 versions of those packages, uh, you can say we push the REST solver quite a bit. Everything at AL is a uh, REST package, you know, Maya, New, Houdini, uh, and even REST is packaged and released as a REST package. And then we have this tool called Launcher. Um, this is our artist facing tool and the individual item here called preset. And when a user just uh, click on that, it launches the application on a REST environment. In turns, then we have um, uh, our farm, um, our farm just uh, go through this uh, tool called Launcher through the API, and then it talks to Launcher. Launcher gives you a runtime environment, and it renders always happening in those uh, environments. 
The takeaway here is that um, um, animal is uh, really invested uh, in, in rest. And the hybrid approach uh, that I'm gonna show you is an incremental approach uh, that extends on the existing tool that, that we already have. So let's start with a definition. When a bill is reproducible. A bill is reproducible if given the same source code, bill environment, and bill instruction, any party can recreate bit by bit identical copies of the spe specified artifacts. Let's break this down a bit. Uh, when you said um, same source code, that's an easy one these days. You can manage this with bit, bit tags or any sort of SCM tags. Then same bill environment and bill instruction. When you see that, uh, we immediately think on REST, right? So after all, the bill instruction are the essential part of the REST package. And given the same source of the same REST request, uh, you know, the recom is in the package and the timestamp, REST should give you the same environment every time. So what's the problem? Um, the problem is here, any party. Um, not everybody can create the same artifact, at least not at every point in time. So let me dig bigger um, and talk about build environments for a moment. To start off, uh, let's discuss some of the problems we face with build environments. Our system looks something like this. Uh, the base image is provided by a system department, is managed with Ansible and contains all the low level libraries uh, from YAM packages that are not RESIFIED. Then we have the NFS central uh, REST repository with all the in house REST packages. And that's where all, all they live. And then the third party packages that lives in the same place. Um, if we request a REST a runtime environment, we uh, get a build environment, we get something like this. So what exactly the problem is, um, for example, power user with pseudo privilege can modify those, uh, those orange YUM packages um, for development and research purposes. And then the system engineer team, uh, you know, they, they need to update that over time. So either for security or when they need a, a, another application. And then we have this custom build from the third party packages, mostly the C++ packages that configure time they will use, uh, detect different low level packages and, and can end up with uh, different builds or worse, they can end up be linked to libraries that do not exist on other machines. In conclusion, we can say that you know, REST does not have control over this uh, orange layer and it's not enough to guarantee the full build reproducibility. So the problem is, is that moving part and we need to find uh, somehow a way to freeze this layer. So how we solve it? We did a container investigation and we settled in Singularity. For the one that uh, do not know uh, what Singularity, just think on Docker for now. Uh, I have to say that the selection of the container technology was not a minor point. It was kind of crucial indeed, but uh, I won't talk uh, about that today. Uh, and if you're interested, we can discuss that in the QA. Then we built a Singularity uh, CentOS 74 base image with the YAM packages on the orange layer that contain all the libraries that is uh, on our REST environments that were not already part of uh, an existing package. After that, we bootstrapped the machines in our Jenkins and Pin City to build from those Singularity images. We reimaged the CI machines with CentOS 7.8 and run all the tests. And once they were all succeeding, we proved the point that this uh, hybrid approach was um, worth following. Then, uh, to make it transparent for the user, Thomas Lam, a developer on the Toolchain team, created a container plugin for REST, which allows us to run the REST build and REST release inside a Singularity container. And at that point, uh, we achieved transparent full reproducible build from the CentOS 74 images, which was not a minor milestone. When I say transparent, uh, this is what I mean. So here you can say that I'm in a CentOS 7A machine and my um, dummy package uh, requires CentOS 74. And now using the um, same REST build command interface, the build happened inside the Singularity image. And actually you didn't notice any difference since the Singularity bootstrap took like about 0.3 seconds. 
And if you check inside the contents of the package, you can see that uh, has been annotated using that singularity image. So you can use that later for reproducibility. So now I'm just demonstrating, uh, you know, when we change the image or the first time, if you clear the cache of singularity, it will take about, you know, four seconds to download that image. And then it will do the build inside. But as you can see, that's quite transparent for the users. So benefits of this approach. Um, the build now happen in a fixed singularity image and produce reproducible bit by bit uh, build artifact. I put a link here for the default benefits of reproducible build that you might know, but on top of that, uh, for us, it has meant that uh, we have full control of the build environment and we are in, independent of the um, system engineer department. So now uh, for the first time, now R&D can move to a newer OS version and without having to wait for the whole facility. The CI machine are the same as the dev machines. And system, they can, you know, they can upgrade the system without interfering with the bills. And we can also experiment with the uh, NVIDIA drivers now because it's just a mount on the content. So let's move quickly into runtime environment and start again by enumerating some of the common problems uh, with the current REST runtime environments. Um, this is the famous, uh, it works in my machine, right? Uh, when the target machine environment is different from where we build and test. Uh, next, uh, slow startup right time. This is all because the rest packs are pulled from NFS. Another performance implication is the amount of fail file stats caused by tools installing non-default location. I'm pretty sure you, you're most familiar with the problem of the long Python path and LD library path. And lastly, this is not cloud friendly. You know, the cloud OS needs to match the OS. And in our case, every time we spin a machine, we have to run Ansible to make sure we, we started from the same uh, starting point. Solution. Well, the next logical step uh, here was to use Singularity at runtime. So that's what we did. We created a REST version where all the REST commands, including RESM, run inside the same Singularity image. Then we added the ability to our launcher to set the singularity image. So when someone um, someone clicks now, it gets inside this uh, singularity container, you know, get a REST environment and launch the application from there. Uh, benefits. Uh, now, when we combine the container image with REST or runtime environment, it can be exactly the same as the environment where we build and test our software changes. Uh, from this point on, the phrase, I cannot repro that in my machine, should just disappear. Uh, this also allows us to maintain different shows under different OS version, as I show you. Now it's really easy just changing one variable in the launcher, which is, uh, you know, there's a real value for production here um, when you're running multiple shows in parallel. And as a consequence of that, we also do not have to upgrade to upgrade the whole facility. We can just migrate uh, one show at a time. And once we build confidence, we can move to, to the next one. Now, if I go to my previous slide, uh, here we have solved uh, this problem here, which is not minor, and a bit of this one. But what about these other two points? Uh, this is where specialized image come in place. Uh, the idea here is, I mean, this is work in progress and we're currently exploring this, but the idea here is to make an image for each major version of the DCC. And, um, you know, one for Maya 2020, one Maya 22, Houdini, et cetera, et cetera. And then we want to move away from this uh, RESTify third party packages and install the software uh, and, and just move it inside the container and install it uh, natively. Um, so then we want to represent uh, each image just a REST package. Uh, there's a bit of inception here, but um, we got it solved. And then this package, instead of having contents, it will just have a, a URI um, pointing to that specialized uh, image. And somehow uh, we have to find a way to communicate what packages uh, provide to the REST layer so we can uh, choose the right variant in the AL packages. And we're thinking of using uh, either ephemerals or implementing this uh, provide feature. So following our example, uh, instead of a single base container, we have now a 
Maya 2022, RB 2021, and so on. And so then the respective rest runtime environment are composed by this fixed layer by the, and also by this dynamic rest layer. And with this configuration, the uh, benefit uh, with seeking is that it should improve uh, the startup time and performance. This is because now the bulky packages are leaving the image and are cached locally. There should be less crushes and better stability. This is because we are installing the package natively. And also by doing this, we're reducing the package count and, and we should be getting faster resolve and hopefully uh, less conflicts. And lastly, this uh, image should be more crowd friendly. And so we can spin a cloud machine and just run the job inside these uh, specialized images. So just to close it off, uh, I wanted to spend just my last minute or so, something I think it is very important to highlight here, uh, and that's uh, return on investment. You know, 10 years ago, at uh, the time when I started an, an animal uh, with an R&D team of 10 people, creating a two chain team inside R&D, even of one person, was not an easy sell, but animal had the vision, or I would say uh, it took a bet, and, and and it will be a good return on investment. So they embraced the idea of the two chain team, and the software culture change that uh, this implied. And now in hindsight, we can say that the investment has been paying dividends. And I hope I show you in the presentation some of the benefits of reproducible build environments. And now not just for R&D, but production. But um, in general terms, the work in, in two chains is vital for R&D and ProTech. Uh, it allows R&D to scale with agility and with more than a decent software quality, you know, for an industry where the pixel on the screen are the final product and not the software tool uh, per se, this is quite an achievement. So that's all for me. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you again to Thomas Lam for the plugin implementation, the uh, work in Singularity, and Sertan for presenting Singularity um, to us in the first place and pushing the adoption with the facility and deployment. Awesome. Man, thanks for your guy. I can't, I can't imagine how many problems that solved. <laughs> like so many problems. Um, all right, so now we've got um, John and Ryan. All right. There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm John Hood. I'm presenting here with Ryan Botriel. Now, full disclosure, I, I paid Danny to talk me up, and I got my money's worth because really I didn't contribute as much to this project as he might have led you to believe. This is really the work of Ryan and a lot of talented engineers at ImageWorks who came together to kind of put this concept together that we're gonna talk about today. And really what we wanna talk about is kind of ImageWorks journey from SVN to SBK, uh, which is a story of, of, of code management and package distribution. So let me set the stage for you. The year was 2006. Maya was a version seven. Python wasn't even a language in VFX, but we had a lot of movies to make. And I mean, a lot of movies. So the problem we had, how do we manage software for a large community of coders with varying degrees of skill? Our solution was SVN, kinda. We developed a wrapper called VC Tools around SVN uh, that would allow ease of use for, for multiple TDs of different levels. Uh, this was for our MEL scripts. For our C++ code, uh, we had a system, oh, sorry, uh, a different system. The, S, the uh, custom wrapper for VC tools allowed simple check-in and check-out, uh, which was a one-step process. Uh, it, the MEL language supported sparse checkouts, so TDs could easily check out just the files they wanted to modify. Uh, they could check those in, but checking in would be an actual release. So there was no kind of hold, and modify or code review process. And unit testing was a concept that didn't exist really. Everything was pretty much tested in production. For our C++ side, we had a loader that would, based on environment variables, select the correct DCC, uh, SO for DCCs based on compiler and DCC type. So what happened? Well. Code became more complex, 
scripts evolved into libraries. Uh, we had no real unit testing, as I mentioned before. Code reviews were difficult. Python was introduced. It had a completely different sourcing mechanism from what Mel was doing, including more involved packages that need to be managed together. Uh, and we had no versioning system really. So there was no way to target packages with Python or really C++ plus plus code in ways that we found useful. All of our projects were getting more complicated. Individual films require really specific tweaking of our libraries. What worked, it was a good system in a lot of ways. It was very easy to use. There was no branching concept. The one-step check-in, check-out was very easy for people to, to pick up who weren't super technical. Uh, there was no real version tracking, which kind of made it easy. People would check out files into their dev area. They would test them uh, and then check them in when they wanted to release. It was easy to develop. Uh, you would launch your DCC, whether it was Maya or Nuke uh, or Houdini even. Uh, you could launch it in dev mode where the Python and Mel lookup paths, whichever one was appropriate, would, would actually pick up the, uh, the files that you were looking for. Uh, and again, with sparse checking out, you only had to modify the files that you were interested in. Also, there was no configuration. So you didn't have to figure out which package or which version of packages were compatible. Uh, so there were no images to build or virtual environments to set up. So to kind of expand on the ease of use, we came across GitLab, which was a very common uh, tool. It was awesome. Uh, it allowed us to manage larger, more complex packages. It provided for code reviews with the merge request mechanism. And we were able to take advantage of the CI and CD managed unit testing for deployment. But the packaging part still eluded us. Uh, we looked at different packaging options, we looked at Conda. We had some groups that were using Res. We looked at Nix. But none of these packages really fit all the things that we wanted to do. So at this point, we figured a rethink was required. And along, around this time is where Ryan had come into the picture and he was working with our Infra team to figure out what, how we could move forward. Thanks, John. Yeah. So. We really took a step back and wanted to think about what we really needed, uh, what would ultimately make our lives easier as developers and kind of help us be more productive and, and deliver to production. So along with this, we came up with some primary goals, what we would like to see in such a system. The first one is this idea of a clean user experience, um, really just making sure that, you know, the kind of the way you want to do it or you feel like you should do it in the system is actually the right way to do it. It sort of leads you to do it properly. Um, consistent environments, as much as possible, we wanted to, to the, the dev and production environments to be the same, this is, you know, the same thing we've talked about, about having, yeah, it works on my machine. Um, the third one is hackable runtime, um, which is something we are very used to, of being able to try things very quickly on the fly, right? with sparse checkouts and only changing one file and seeing how it runs. So it's something, it's a workflow we wanted to maintain. Uh, the escapable system was another requirement. And um, again, as we thought about adding like versioning and packaging and kind of all of these systems and rules around releasing software, one of the things we also wanted to keep was this ability to kind of go around the system <laughs> if needed, kind of this dirty fixes or things. Um, you know, if there's a production deadline or something, you don't want uh, all of these additional rules that you put in place to, to, to slow you down or to, to be the problem or reason why something doesn't deliver on time. And lastly, kind of as a more technical requirement is this idea of efficient storage. So we wanted to be able to, you know, look forward into uh, improving our integration with cloud environments and things like that, where sometimes, you know, having one giant NFS mount with all your software at all versions is not necessarily something that's very maintainable. So having this idea of like offlining software, pushing and pulling in uh, between different places uh, was something we wanted the system to support. There's a couple of inspirations we took to help drive this project, um, mainly Docker and containers and Git. Um, what we're kind of pulling from the, the container world is this idea of runtime predictability. Um, as Fede mentioned, the dev and prod are the same, which is a huge benefit to that. Um, and also this isolation that you get makes it really easy to change things and try things on the fly because you're not affecting other people when you do that. Um, and then Git, uh, Git, we really kind of are pulling this idea of this painless pushing and pulling of files. Um, it's really easy to sync Git changes uh, you know, between one computer and another. Um, and also it has this uh, idea of local copies. Again, that's just makes it really easy to change things safely. 
So the result of this whole process <laughs> is these two pieces of technology, SPFS and SPK. SPFS is kind of a lower level um, piece of software that deals with file system isolation, capture and distribution. I'm gonna talk about that one. Um, and SPK is a package manager on top of that system. Again, I'll talk about that one as well. So first up is SPFS. There's three main pieces to this per process, layered file system, shared digest based storage. I know that's a lot of words, so I will break this down a little bit farther. The first idea here is uh, the idea of the layered file system. And in a normal file system, you have these files that you have uh, in, in a folder, if you will. Um, and then when you talk about an overlay file system or a layered file system, it's just this idea of taking you know, multiple directories, if you will, and layer them, layering them on top of each other. So if you have a file in both layers, each with the same name, then you only see the one in the, in the top layer. Um, the other benefit that this system has is uh, it has this final layer at the top, which contains any edits that you make to the file system, which just means that the files that you're putting in the lower layers don't can't be affected or can't be changed. So the copy that you have of those lower level files on disk um, can be considered immutable. You don't have to have right access to them to be able to actually make changes or try making changes at runtime. This kind of helps us with some of the sparse override stuff and also a lot of that uh, kind of safety uh, and, and kind of runtime hackability that I was talking about. The second aspect to SPFS um, is this kind of more Linux specific technology of per process namespacing. Um, and so what this looks like really is SPFS, it, it controls this directory, this root directory on your system, this slash SPFS area. Um, so whenever you enter into one of these SPFS environments, the contents of that directory is going to be kind of rendered out or shown to you uh, through the system. And the key aspect here is that every process that runs on your computer can actually see a different set of files inside that directory. So in this example, I have Houdini running and Maya running separately, and they can both see a separate set of files with separate software, um, the dependencies that they need in the application and you know, a different set of runtime packages or runtime software. Um, so again, this gives us the isolation and hackability that we wanted. Um, and also giving us consistency of the software is always in the same place, no matter which process you run, even if it's different software each time. And finally, this idea of um, shared digest based storage. So essentially, uh, SPFS, when you are storing things in the system and you're creating these file system layers, it's actually you know, creating a hash for each file, it's tracking it by the content. So it only has to store each unique file exactly once on disk. Uh, which basically means you know we get some of the efficiencies of our sparse checkouts and things like that where um, i might have a large python package when i make a new version of that package if i only change one file then i'm not actually storing a copy of all of the files in the package i'm only storing the original version and the one file that changed um, so this just makes it quite efficient and it kind of pulls from some of that good stuff for pushing and pulling files it knows exactly what it needs to move from one site to another um, to make sure that the software is available. So that's SPFS. So on top of it, um, we added this package manager called SPK. SPFS, as you can imagine, it's a fairly kind of low level interface. You're kind of creating layers and layer them on top of each other, but it can become quite um, hectic to try to manage that. So SPK gives a little bit of order. It kind of provides tracking of files and also this idea of compatibility and versioning of software as you kind of would imagine in any package manager. So there's this larger theme to SPK of being able to properly describe compatibility kind of in a useful way and a debuggable way. So we don't always get to choose the way things are versioned, especially when we're dealing with third-party software. So the first thing that SPK provides is the idea of kind of being able to describe on a per package basis what the version number actually represents. Um, you know, in this example, there's like the major version number is no compatibility. So you shouldn't be swapping in between the major version numbers without kind of a developer going in and making a choice. Um, and the reason for this, again, is just to be able to accurately describe what they do and then to have the SPK package manager actually be a little bit more intelligent and be able to help you make the right decision at the right time, depending on the context, whether you need binary compatibility or API compatibility um, and, and, and stuff like that. To expand on this, um, 
one of the things we found with a lot of other systems is they try to kind of hang a lot more information than you'd want into the single version number. Uh, and it can be very hard as a developer sometimes to know which version of a package you should take and what each version might represent or what was different in between them. So one of the things that SPK provides is this idea of compatibility beyond the version number. So essentially anything that's used as an input to, an, uh, to the build of an SPK package can also be used when you're resolving that package. Uh, this example is a Python 3.7 package. And you can see it has some kind of these uh, labels or options attached to it. Uh, it was built without debugging. It was built against GCC 10 on Linux. Um, it has the actual Python API there. So there's custom ones. Um, and again, the key to this one is that I can then be a lot more specific and a lot more explicit and kind of verbose when I describe my dependency on Python. If I am dependent on the specific Python API, I can list that in my package as well as the dependency on Python. Um, and it's a lot easier for another developer to read that and understand and kind of uh, get a sense of what exactly I'm dependent on and how strict that dependency is. And of course, finally, um, this, because SPK is built on top of SPFS, you kind of get all the benefits that, that I described with SPFS. And the way that looks in practice is that every package that you create is one of these file system layers in SPFS. So your runtime environments um, are equally hackable. You know, you can run an SPK environment, get all the packages you want. And then if you need to, you can go into, you know, the Maya package itself or the Python package itself and change one file somewhere um, just to try something out. And that's totally uh, achievable. Yeah, so that, that gives uh, the efficient storage as well. And like the other things I mentioned about SPFS. And that's pretty much it. Um, if you're curious about this or you want to talk about this kind of stuff, we would love to hear from you. We're having a lot of conversations about this technology. So uh, yeah, definitely happy to talk about it. And of course, we'd be happy to take any questions, which I think is coming up now. It is. It is. Perfect segue. All right. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, and then there we go. You can, uh, you can come back. Oh, yeah, you're right there. Uh, Okay, great. We've got just a couple minutes. So I'm going to dive right into questions. Um, this one is kind of for everyone. Um, so what is the single biggest challenge in transitioning from classical development process to a modern DevOps workflow? That's a big one. Well, I think the biggest challenge, the soapbox that I am always on is that uh, in, in VFX production, we, we want to use like a lot of best practices, but VFX companies don't run like software companies. And I think that sometimes, you know, you can't fit exactly like commercial standard DevOps workflows into some of the things we do. It's part of the reason we're pushing on the SBK solution is just because, you know, the, the types of fine tuning that we have to do and the types of, of changes we have to make and the way we work, uh, it's, you, you don't wanna like compromise your workflow too much by trying to fit into kind of another industry's uh, workflow. What you want to do is kind of cherry pick the things from software development that, that work really well uh, and the, the standards and workflows that make sense, but maybe configure them a little bit uh, to suit you know, how we work. Uh, I think that's the biggest challenge, really. Does anybody else have anything? Wrong yeah, I, I would just add, you know, my thoughts on that are that uh, we're a little bit unique as an industry because uh, we, we look at all these other, you know, DevOps kind of practices, and a lot of them are very web-based and kind of um, software as a service kind of based things. But we have a lot of developers working all the time on a single, kind of like a single code base, like a one large environment, if you will. And it's all desktop software. And there's just not the same kind of um, best practices laid out for that kind of workflow because most people are moving as much as possible towards web. So we do, we do that where we can, you know, move things into web services, but at the end of the day, um, a lot of the desktop side stuff is a little bit, we kind of have to invent it ourselves or like John said, pull what we can from the others. I just want to add just one more thing. Uh, I mean, it's kind of, kind of the same with what this has been said, but um, I came from a different industry where, you know, telecommunication where the, you know, software is, a, is this software product and, and you can easily sell the idea of uh, all the DevOps and, and what the benefits are, you know, but um, 
uh, I guess, uh, you know, thinking about my journey here is more about the cultural change that you have to, to, to do for the software development. Uh, you know, the developer want to do the right thing, but they don't, they're not given the time for, from production and they don't understand the need. So I guess the, to answer the question is just to, the challenging part is how to sell the value that it provides uh, you know, down the track. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, it's the same thing. I, I've done both traditional software development and worked in VFX, and it's just like it's it's trying to make it work underneath those timelines. You know, a regular DevOps timeline does not work with production. It's like try to take those best practices and squish it into eighteen minutes. Um, yeah, it's very difficult. Um, okay, this one uh, I believe is for Federico. Why singularity over Docker? So uh, the reasons are like, you know, uh, first one, I guess, is that uh, it's not a daemon process, so you don't need uh, sudo to run it. So there's no uh, root privilege escalation and the containers always run as, a, as the user automatically. So there's no sudo inside. The performance is fantastic. Uh, I haven't compared, but I, I, I've been running this uh, at runtime and it's no difference as bare metal. Uh, it's really easy to use. It's distributed as a single uh, distributable um, executable. And you can build from existing Docker images. And you know, just the concept uh, has been done to exactly what Brian said. Like you, you want to just uh, have the right level of isolation. You know, Docker is much more contained and, and you have to unlock. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's possible. Uh, we make that plugin in general. So you can add a Docker plugin if you wish. But um, this way, you know, you get uh, the graphic card, you can access directly. So you have not native access to the graphic card. I'm pretty sure there are ways around Docker, but uh, this one is, uh, feels much more simple. And, and if you read uh, exactly, you know, the singularity vision is, I mean, it, this is a, a technology that comes from the HPC world. Um, so they want to use the whole, the whole system and not just, uh, um, you know, microsystem and put a lot of uh, Docker container. It's just one thing that I uh, use all the resources of the machine. That's awesome. That's good to know. I have uh, Docker running right now and I can barely run the Zoom meeting. So <laughs> that's good to know. Um, okay, and then for anyone who's, it sounds like everyone's worked with Res. Um, so we had a question that um, for them, they had performance issues. How are you working with, you know, 2000 plus packages, 60,000 versions? Like how are you dealing with, with those performance issues? Uh, we did, uh, we have several, uh, cache things. So I had to implement some, something on top of, uh, of rest. So I had a file system cache, which just, uh, uh, create like a subset of these, uh, 2000 packages and all this version and just put in a, just a trick with sim links, uh, which puts all the packages in a, in a different rest repository, if you wish. So then at any given time, you know, REST is seen a subset of those, of this 60,000 version I mentioned. It's just seen, I don't know, uh, two, 3,000. So I have some, a job that just, uh, you know, uh, uh, over time, it just removes everything that is not used in production. So that's how we keep it, uh, you know, kind of fast. And also, you know, if the result is coming from the um, uh, memcache, uh, which uh, REST provides that feature, uh, is, you know, it's always one, one to two seconds. Uh, when it misses the cache, this is uh, when we need a result of uh, a minute. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'm actually I'm going to ask another question. We'll run a few minutes long, but for anybody who's watching and needs to jump, um, you can also go to the community section of um, the conference and ask questions there, and the speakers will be in there and stuff like that. Um, so, okay, for everybody, last question. Um, how do you get TDs comfortable with DevOps roles or DevOps folks comfortable coming over to those TD workflows and getting them in the pipeline? Uh, I can, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of enforcement, but uh, in this industry, it doesn't work. And with the pressure of, yeah, with the pressure of the, the TD has, like, you know, dailies and stuff, it just doesn't need to. So I'll say that it was a slow process. I mean, just showing the benefits and, over time, it, it took more than a, than a wish, but in this uh, 10 years time, they, they come aboard with uh, uh, with all this. So it, it's a lot of um, um, also, you know, teaching, doing, you know, running some uh, some workshops just to they understand 
uh, not just the, how to use it, but also the benefits and, and they, they come aboard. I mean, they, they wanna do the right thing. They definitely wanna uh, do the right thing. So um, I guess, uh, I mean, slow process, but it's worth it to have everybody on board. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. We're getting more and more uh, TDs that are familiar with Git and more IDEs that are kind of Git aware. So from the source code side of things, uh, we're like we're still kind of a little early in our transition for a lot of our TDs over to the Git workflow, and we have requests from TDs to migrate over to Git. So having that having that excitement on the client side is really useful because it helps us, you know, manage that migration as opposed to imposing it on somebody. Right? If people are asking for it, um, that that really helps a lot. And so I think just Git being more common out there in the world with VS Code and other editors, I think has really helped a lot in terms of allowing us to integrate some of those practices into our, our code source management. Yeah, I would say one strategy too that I, I find to be useful, you know, kind of like John mentioned, like uh, I find with most people, they, they want to do the good practices or even they know them and are used to doing them at other companies or in their side projects. And so it's almost annoying that they can't use them <laughs> internally. And so that is a big benefit. Um, and I feel like, one of the kind of useful strategies is to kind of do an opt-in process where, you know, if you have a new set of tools and they can pretty easily um, slot into the existing workflows, but then you have all this additional feature set of like, oh, if you want to version things properly or you want to add all these additional pieces for compatibility and turn it into a real package, um, kind of as an incremental, like take a project, use it in the new system, but then also kind of add these things as you learn them. So it doesn't have to be like, okay, everybody stop, migrate all your things, learn this whole new system and never look back. Um, because that's, that is asking a little bit too much, I think, especially things like that I mentioned with the TDs and production deadlines, like you don't want to ask somebody to need to take a whole week to learn something new because it's just unreasonable. Yeah, I think a big thing like about that too is like, getting those, like you were talking, removing those barriers of entry is really big too. Like, you know, making sure it's it's as easy as possible to transition has it's been hugely helpful for me. Um, okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, again, um, anybody, if you wanna continue any of these conversations, things like that, jump into the community. Um, and then thanks to all the speakers. That was really great, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.